Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the new virtual talk series hosted by the Chinese Canadian Museum, the Finding Your Family's Paper Trail three-part series. This regional program is funded by the Government of Canada. And my name is Rosalie Gunawan, Education and Public Programs Coordinator at the museum. The Chinese Canadian Museum is located on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples in what is now Vancouver, Chinatown. We value the interconnected and ongoing histories of Indigenous peoples and Chinese Canadians and strive to reflect on and share these diverse stories. We invite you all to also reflect on your relationship with your host nations if you are um, a settler on these lands. It is a pleasure to have Catherine Clement, the curator of our future exhibition, The Paper Trail to the 1923 Chinese Exclusion Act here with us today. Uh, she will be available to help respond to questions posted in this webinar's Q&A alongside our museum's Sarah Ling, exhibition and program manager, and Naomi Louie, museum assistant. Today's first lecture, Finding Your Family's Paper Trail, is presented by Linda Yip. Linda is a highly sought out professional genealogist spe specializing in Chinese Canadian genealogy. She is the author of Getting Started in Chinese Genealogy, a family historian's guide, even if you don't read or speak Chinese, which is currently available in its second edition with a third edition in the works. In addition to her paid work, Linda has been doing invaluable community work through her public resources online. Her blog, pastpresence.com has become a trusted resource worldwide and her Facebook group Genealogy for Asian Canadians is a beloved virtual community connecting genealogy enthusiasts across the country. So today Linda has a jam-packed presentation that will last 60 minutes and the remaining time until 1130 will be dedicated to answering questions. Uh, please feel free to ask any questions that you have in the webinar Q&A. You can find the button to that um, at the bottom bar near the um, video um, area. And we will select from these questions that are submitted to ask Linda in real time, as well as answering some of them um, in text. Uh, this webinar is being recorded today, so it will be available on the Chinese Canadian Museum's website um, for this talk program uh, by the end of the week. And we will also be sending a handout in the chat with the links for these resources um, in a couple of minutes. So without further ado, I will now turn this over to Linda. Thank you so much for being here with us today, Linda. It is an honor and a pleasure. Let me get my stuff set up here. Uh, can you give me a thumbs up, make sure that we have the right screen and everything is good. All right. Uh, yeah, you'll just need to click start presentation. Yep. We're good. Thank you, everyone. It is an honor and a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much to the Chinese Canadian Museum for asking me to host and to everyone who has given me support in preparing this uh, presentation. I have lots more thank yous at the very end, but particularly the museum and the, the team of the paper trail. Thank you. Sorry, Linda, I'm just gonna interrupt really quick. We can still see your note screen. Um, so you'll just need to switch that view. There you go, that's good. Okay. Thank you, Rosalie. So I am a proud member of the Yipsan family of Vancouver. This is us in 1917. Here's my great-grandfather, my great-grandmother and my 17 year old grandfather. Yip Kyushak, we're gonna mention him uh, a little bit in this talk. Today, my uh, personal private genealogy work for my family encompasses over 2000 people. Every one of these pink squares is a person. What it really is almost is like a map of, of the history of Chinese Canadians before the Exclusion Act. 
My plan for today is to talk to you about what is genealogy, and then we're going to talk about common issues in genealogy, uh, the Exclusion Act, and its unintended side benefits of creating records for Chinese Canadian genealogy. Uh, I will touch on one major issue uh, in uh, encountered in genealogy, uh, then we're going to go right into government records. I will give you a brief update on where we are with Chinese Canadian case files and uh, spend a couple of minutes talking about the handout, which you should be getting shortly. Please have a quick look and open it up. And then at the end, we will wrap. Unfortunately, it's outside of the scope of this talk to discuss adoptions, paper families, genetics, and more recent history. Sorry, but when you get to the end, you'll see why I had to cut it off. So what is genealogy anyway? Genealogy is not the study of rocks, that's geology, but rather the study of family trees and establishing lineages through collecting information to build analytical cases to, to uh, build your lineages. It could be everything from uh, a family, a simple family tree, such as is shown on the screen, to uh, doing what I do as a professional, finding archives, understanding records, understanding laws, and it can encompass every facet from social history to politics to government and so on. Now, generally speaking, in genealogy, the like this is just a very small section of the records that are considered generally available. BMDs are birth, marriage, and death records as well as Canadian census records, church records, citizenship and voting records, tax and probate records, DNA and genetics, immigration records, land records, and wills. However, this is Chinese Canadian genealogy. Don't be put off if you found it really difficult because this is a challenging branch of genealogy. And I have done cases that literally look like this, where I have been able to prove my case using only two categories. Because my person wasn't born, wasn't married, didn't die in the country, uh, they were um, maybe not concluded in the census records, they didn't go to church, they were not citizens, there's no DNA evidence, uh, they did not participate in the crown land, and they didn't die, so there was no will. Instead, we have only the two categories of immigration and tax records, because what two things are a constant? Taxes and, in our case, immigration. So let's hop right into it. What are we talking about here? We're actually talking about the Chinese Exclusion Act, which is actually more properly known as the Chinese Immigration Act, 1885 to 1947. This act was really think of it more as like a system of national laws and regulations controlling all Chinese natural born or immigrated in the country from about 60 years, from over 60 years, from 1885 to 1947. Um, people sometimes get it confused um, that it's only about immigration. If we, if we remove the word immigration from the Chinese Immigration Act, it's really more the Chinese Act. Uh, it, the records created by the, the Chinese Immigration Act were by government officials uh, at the highest level of government, right on down through um, national, uh, municipal inspectors. It was comprehensive. There was an over-documentation of Chinese. The records created are almost countless and it stretched over decades. There are currently three sets of foundational records for Chinese Canadian genealogy. The GRCI is my shorthand for the General Register of Chinese Immigration. CI9s are Chinese reentry forms, 1885 to 1952. The paper trail collection, which came online in 2023, Thank you to the team for finding them, uncovering them, like just everything which brought us to today where we can now add them to the set of foundational records. I will go into this in depth. Uh, CI certificates and the CI44 records. But before we get there to the records, we need to start with names. Complicated Chinese names. Okay, so 
this is a really big topic and I could literally talk about this for hours, but let's go with these bullet points. First of all, there were many, many names for Chinese people. A Chinese man could have five names. A Chinese woman before her marriage could have uh, two iterations for names. Those names in Chinese could then be transliterated into English with many, many, many spellings, depending on the immigration official who heard it, the people who transcribed it. And so therefore, the one point I am trying to express is that name-based or nominal searches are less effective. In European genealogy, some kinds of genealogy, you can really focus in on the individual. You just use their name, search, and use other um, techniques to narrow down. But in Chinese genealogy, cluster research is key. You search may need to include family and friends to be sure that the person you're looking for is the right person. And so therefore using non-nominal non searching techniques such as searching by age, date, location, occupation, these are important factors in Chinese genealogy. For example, here's a table. So we have Wu, Wang, and Li. And the surname Wu in English could be spelled any of these. So for Chinese genealogy, please don't get hung up on the spelling of your English name. Your correct Chinese genealogy name is your character. Similarly with Wu, uh, Wong, have a look at all the different ways that you can spell it. This literally, these Wong and all of these could be your direct relations, but in English, they could be spelled a multiplicity of ways. Li has all of these and much more. And, and so conversely, let's look at it the other way. There are actually homonyms in Chinese as well. Wu, Wang, and Li. Wu has uh, these two, which uh, could be Wu. These two could be Wang. And these three could be Li. So be aware, Chinese names are complex. And therefore, when you're using Google Translate to translate names from Chinese, into English, that is a better way, um, or rather, let me say it the other way, you cannot use English names to translate your Chinese surname. Therefore, in the handout, I have put these five points. If you were looking for your Chinese surname, the best way to do it is to ask your family and friends, the ones who lived with that surname, ask them to write it down for you, ask them to write it in traditional Chinese and in simplified, both. And so if they don't know it, they wrote it in simplified or you can't ask them, grave markers. Those are your next best uh, clue for finding them. Traditional Chinese grave markers had the names and often clues about finding the home village. Uh, don't forget to check for extended relatives grave markers. Remember your family was really big and the family surname could have been carried by many more people than your direct patrilineal lineage. Also government records, occasionally a government record does contain the Chinese name if your ancestor was literate and if the government official could write Chinese. Those are two big ifs. And then consider for those of us with paper families, a second family situation. If your great great grandfather had a couple of families, check the other family for grave markers and that information. So, in this talk today, I'm going to cover four of the five major online free databases for Chinese genealogy. Now, another thing that I want to point out is that no one site contains all records for really any genealogy. Just to take that as a given. No one site has everything. In our case, Library and Archives Canada has CI9s, the General Register, and um, CI certificates. Heritage Canadiana, which is also another national site, has CI9s, CI44s, and the General Register. UBC has CI, uh, um, the CI certificates and the General Register. Ancestry has the CI44s. Family Search has CI44s and the General Register. And we're going to be looking at four of those. So let's start off with the CI44s. What are they? <laughs> yeah. So 1923 Chinese Exclusion Act, Section 18 provided
shall register before one of the registrars whose name, title, and address appear below. Parents or guardians of children of Chinese origin or descent under 13 years of age shall register for such children. These children must, however, appear personally before the registrar. So to say that again, unless government speak, every Chinese person in the country after from 1923 onwards was registered for a CI-44 form or else fa faced uh, terrible penalties, a massive fine and or jail. This was printed in the Canada Gazette, 18th August, 1923. So this brings me to this story, which is a photo of my family. This is my grandfather, Yip Kyu Shek, his wife, Chi Wai Ming, my dad, and his brother. And when I found this photo in my family's uh, collection, there was no date, but I instantly recognized my fa the faces. But I was thinking, well, wait, wait, wait a second. That that picture seems really familiar. What it was something? What is so familiar about that picture? And then it hit me. It was the same photo session as my dad's CI forty five card. Here he is. It's not the same photo, but it was for sure the same session. Chinese families who registered for the photo requirement of the CI-44 forms did this in studios. And so you may have a portrait that is related to the CI-44 process. Now, CI-45 cards were issued to native-born Chinese. My dad was a native-born Canadian twice over. And to be quite honest, this is the record that started me on my genealogical journey. When I was just a kid, I found this hidden in my dad's drawer and it instantly confused me because it says his name and I recognize his cute two-year-old face. But what, what is this? Dominion of Canada, Department of Immigration and Colonization. My dad was born in Canada. What about birthright? What, what, what about that? And then we've got the section 18 gobbledygook and, and the registration date. What, what is that? And then the thing that really hit me was this. This certificate does not establish legal status in Canada. What does that even mean? And when I asked my father, he couldn't tell me. This is the genesis of me as a genealogist today, understanding the Chinese Immigration Act. So the CI-44 collection, the paper trail collection that is available has two components. There's an index card and there are forms. I do recommend that you try to find both for each one of your people. Remember, every Chinese in the country, we're talking about 60,000 people. Um, on the card, the index card, you will find names, aliases, the CI-44 number, age, the date they were registered, place of birth, uh, possibly a date of birth, and then some notes. Chinese immigration officials often had notes. They can be used to help find the form. So this is um, my dad's, which is incorrect because that's not actually his name. It has an extra age. Native born, 29th July, 1922. CI44 number 16313, age three. Actually, he was two. I registered uh, 11th June, 1924. So use, if you can't find it in records, use that information. Secondly, there's the form. Now the form is the real gold mine. Uh, it, it has a photo, names, aliases, gender, address information, occupation, age, birth, and immigration info, head tax information, paid or exemptions, not in this case, uh, physical characteristics and immigration notes. As they say, you know, collect the set. Where do you find them? Okay, so you can find them in three places. They're indexed on Ancestry and Family Search. The indexes are not the same, so feel free to use the same search uh, criteria in both. It is not re uh, indexed, but it is available on Heritage Canadiana. And here, I'm going to show you how to search on Ancestry. I'm going to begin by searching for these records on Ancestry. You do not need a subscription to Ancestry, which is a paid subscription site, to access these records. All you need is an email address. The link is in your handout. I do have a subscription, and so I'm signed in under my name. 
the reason why you want to provide Ancestry with your email address in order to gain access to these records, which were digitized and OCR by Ancestry as part of their philanthropic initiative to make culturally significant records available to everyone for free. The tools in this search box make it much easier to search, although I will say that doesn't make them easy, just easier. As we know, Chinese genealogy is not easy. I'm going to start by showing you how many tries it takes to find my father. We saw his certificate earlier, and so I will look for his certificate here. I know he was born in 1922 in Vancouver. Nope, no matches, but don't be disheartened. This is an example of how searching by name is problematic. Now, if you paid attention, you will notice that my father who went by Cecil was not registered under his English name, but rather his Chinese name, which is Wing C. Let's try that. We've got a lot of results, but none of them look like my dad. Do you know what I do see? Wing Dake. Wing Dake is my father's brother. And in 1924, would have been just born. This is a really big clue, and I'll show you why. Oh, there's, I'll open that, take a new tab. And I'll open that in a new tab. Let's first look at this. The Chinese immigration number 44 records are index cards and forms. But let's start with the results. If you haven't used Ancestry yet, it will have the information transcribed from the card and then the card itself. If you click on the image, you will see the card. This says Yip Wing Dick, native born, 14th of March, 1924, CI 44 number 16312, three months old, registered the 11th of June, 1924. This is a valuable piece of information. And the next thing that I would do is capture the source citation by copying all of this. And then under tools, downloading this for my records. There. Let's look at the other file. It says, Wing Dick Yip in the Canada Chinese Exclusion Act Records uh, collection. It has a bunch of transcribed information, some of which is correct. For example, Dick was a boy, not a girl. And here is my grandfather. It's pretty close to the spelling of his real name. Moving on to the form. Copy the source citation information. This is available from the second icon down. And then under the third icon or the tools, I would download this form for my record. This is the simplest way to find a single form. Since we know that children under the age of 13 had to be registered for their parents, if you search in the forms and look at the neighboring forms, you will find the parents of the children. I've hit left and that's not the family. So clicking right on the right button. And there's my dad. Hurrah. I have finally found the record I was looking for. So as you can see, even when you have a lot of the information, it still took me four tries to find this record. First, I searched for Cecil Yup under his English name. Then I searched for his Chinese name. 
I still got no results, but I did find his brother. I searched for his brother. And then by clicking around the neighboring records on the collection, I was able to find my dad. This is what it's like to find records for Chinese Canadian genealogy. Now let's have a look at the new CI collection at UBC created by the Paper Trail Collection, a community created collection where for years, the Paper Trail team reached out to people, asked them to look in attics and basements and in boxes of stuff. And did they have a head tax certificate or a CI certificate or anything with their ancestor? People across the country scanned these high-res images to create this community-created database for us to research now. I cannot stress how important it was to create this community database for these records of which thousands were issued, but no known archive was collected for us. So what's on a CI certificate? Information, name, arrival or birth information, photos, immigration information, a CI number, and possibly other CI registration numbers. You can find head tax certificates or CI certificates, entry and landing certificates, whatever you want to call them, at the University of British Columbia at this link. Now, let's have a look at what it looks like to search for these. At the UBC Library, Rare Books and Special Collections is the Paper Trail Collection, where you will find high resolution digitized images of landing certificates. Not only that, but this site is searchable by name. The link is in your handout. Here is the structure of the collection online, really well organized and the work of Jun Chow and the Paper Trail team. You can browse all of the collection by scrolling down this top box, or you can jump to the good stuff by searching here in the search hierarchy box. I'm going to type in a surname and I get these results. I noticed that the search results are not only the name of the person, in this case, Chu Chun Hua, my maternal great grandfather, but also the search results will cross reference. Uh, for example, this is my great grandmother who is the wife of Chukinwa. And if it is in the data in the box, it will also come up there. So for example, if I were to search my surname, it will also provide this result of Chukinwa because, not because it's in the certificate, but because it's down here. And so the search results will search the metadata as well as the certificate name. Now, once you're at the certificate, you can use the button to move between the front and the back, this collection being both front and back of the image because the back of the image may contain important genealogical information, but also to see the image, you click on it, and then you can click on it even once more to see the high resolution image. This is great for when you want to see all the fine details, such as, for example, the signature on the record. In addition, there is download information for a study. And as I mentioned before, the back of the certificate can, can contain important information such as, in this case, there's a registration, which says registration 52383, Vancouver, 27th June, 1924. 
it says section 18 of the Chinese Immigration Act 1923 that tells me that this stamp was for the CI44 registration and there should be a record to find there. This is the date, this is the number. So to review, to find CI certificates at the UBC collection, you can use the drop-down menu. You can search by reading the entire list. You can use the search box. The search box will return results from the entire page, not just the person's name. You can download the desired certificate. So before we leave the UBC collection and the paper trail, if you have one of these certificates, one of these originals in any condition whatsoever, the paper trail is still collecting them. The information uh, is in your handout and I'm sure that we can pop the information on submitting um, an inquiry into submitting a paper trail CI certificate to the collection. Please add one if you haven't done so already. This is really important for our history and our community. All right, so next, let's talk about CI-9s. What are they? <laughs> what are they? Okay, so CI-9s are a were in place from about 1885 to 1952. Uh, they can be thought of as re-entry forms. Chinese persons who left Canada and wanted to return first had to apply for permission to re-enter. So they didn't have to go through all the immigration stuff again and they could still come back. Current archives appear to have CI-9s from about 1910 onwards. However, research suggests that CI-9s or some form of a re-entry permit was in place from 1885. We have recently located a 1908 for example. So research continues into what these things are, where they're available. Right now, there's about 128,000 CI-9s available that were, uh, are, were and are available on microfilm, um, but only 41,000 of these records had been imaged. Now, Lily Cho, in her book, Mass Capture, studies these 40,000 odd records. And if you haven't read it yet, please, <laughs> have a look because it is such a great resource for genealogists. Um, now, last year in 2023, in Genealogy for Asian Canadians, we started to look into these CI9s because one of the big questions that we kept getting was, well, if they're all digitized and arguably on Library and Archives Canada, how come I can't find my person? Like they where in 1935, where's that record? And when we dug into it, we found another finding aid and then realized, holy cow, actually not everything's been digitized. So we attended Library and Archives Canada's talk in 2023, and there they said that H reels and T reels were being prioritized for digitizing. And all we had to do was identify them and ask for them to be priority digitized. And that's what happened. And so uh, LAC, Library and Archives Canada, digitized them. They're hosted on Heritage Canadiana. And then, you know what, Robert Louis uh, had and is le leading a, a team of people, of volunteers who are spending collectively thousands of hours transcribing 87,000 images to build a CI-9 project transcription tool. Now, the goal is that this tool is going to be made available at the National Archives. But in the meantime, if you are having some issues finding your CI-9s and uh, you would need some help or you're not quite sure, like, please, uh, this is ongoing research. So what can you find on a CI-9? A lot of information, names. Uh, proper names, alias names, maybe even a Chinese signature. 
a photo, another photo-based record. The subject was provide was required. Age, date, and place of registration and numbers, the immigration date, the amount of head taxes paid, the status of their exemption, their head tax certificate numbers, maybe their CI-44 number, other file numbers, other file numbers, maybe a Chinese case file, address, occupation, dates of leave and return, physical characteristics, witnesses. I mentioned before, who are their friends and family? Look at the witnesses on CI-9s and then notes from immigration officials. For example, let's have a look at two people. First, let's look at Queenie Yip. Now, Queenie is uh, my extended family, soccer star, member of the Chinese Students Athletics. Here he is playing in a rare photo. So Queenie traveled to the States to play soccer and count them. One, two, three, four, five CI9s. Each one of these forms is an important set of genealogical clues that you can use to spring off and find other things. But immediately when I look at something like this, I think timeline. So we know, for example, from 1935 to 1935, a nine, that Queenie traveled to Seattle, then Bellingham, then Portland, then Seattle, then Bellingham again. It just blows my mind the amount of paperwork a Chinese person had to process to live their life. An unintended benefit of the Chinese Immigration Act are these records which we can use to trace our genealogy. So you can find CI9s in three places. I will demonstrate Library and Archives Canada's collection search. Uh, Heritage Canadiana is not indexed. It's a great resource, but unfortunately outside the scope of today's talk. And as aforementioned in Genealogy for Asian Canadians. In this demonstration, I'm going to show you how to use Library and Archives Canada's collection search to find a Chinese immigration number nine re-entry. The link is in your handout. Go to the collection search. It's fine to enter names here, but I do recommend advanced search. In advanced search, you have a lot of different ways to narrow your field. I will concentrate here on database, on the drop down, going to immigrants from China 1885 to 1952. For researchers who have seen Leopard Archives Canada before, this is where the previous standalone website went. Enter the name here. I did my study on Juan Alexander Daniel. So let's search for him. Remember name, database, immigrants from China, and search. We have two results in the main field. Now here on the left, you can see that the type of record is from the CI9 Vancouver, born in Canada. Juan Alexander Damia was born in Canada. I point this out because the CI9 uh, reentry process applied to all Chinese in Canada, not just those recently immigrated. Juan Alexander Damia was born in Canada. You can click on the digital image here, but I recommend that you click instead on the blue link. That will bring up the whole record with all of the attendant information. This is everything you want to look at by page. Here is where you can copy a permanent link by this, and then you can paste that anywhere. Now, if we weren't sure if this was the right record, you can do the last two three on this button and then use the plus and minus to make it as large as you need in order to read the entire record. I do know this is my person and so I'm going to use the download button 
add to that. I would save all of this information in a notes program with the citation. And that's how you can use Library Archives Canada's collection search for text searchable CI9 certificates. So those are CI9s. We have now seen um, the Ancestry database. We've looked at the collection of paper trail documents at the University of British Columbia. Uh, now let's move on to family search. Now the General Register of Chinese Immigration Let's talk about that first. Now, this was the probably, I'm trying to think if this was the first foundational collection to come online, but what it was is a central register of all the information gathered by immigration officials across the country from coast to coast to coast, or at least coast to coast in those days. It encompassed information from ports, all ports, east and west, from land border crossings, from everywhere. You have to imagine immigration offices across the country submitting constant reports back to the Central Bureau in Ottawa for these ledgers to be updated. What I'm trying to say is that it was not a single once and done document that when an immigrant was registered, that's it. There was no information that was ever updated again. My research shows for one of my great grandmothers, information spanning over 20 years of her life, which shows me that this was very much a working document. Now, there were about 18 of these ledgers, all told. And this is what you can find on it. What's on the General Register of Chinese Immigration? If you haven't found one for your family yet, I do stress that you do need to find the general register. I know it's hard. There are 20 categories of information. And as aforementioned for Chinese Canadian genealogy, every one clue is a jump off point for other information, for other records, for other ways to search. Serial numbers, uh, names, ports, dates of registration, Chinese immigration numbers, there's no known database of CI5s and 6s yet. We're looking. Um, whether they paid a head tax, their gender, their age, their birth information. Um, I won't read the rest of this as it is in the handout, but not only on the general register may you find your person, but be aware that they rarely ever traveled by themselves. They often came, maybe not with relatives that you recognize right away, but extended cousins, people from the village. Look, you really do want to look for people who came in on the same ship on the same day from the same general area. Uh, I'm unable to cover the Excel spreadsheet from UBC, but not only is it free, and I think it was a Canada Council grant, but it is searchable. You can use those criteria to search by non-nominal ways. Uh, say a Chinese merchant in uh, Calgary, it's circa 1915, uh, and that way, for example, if you're good at spreadsheets, but it's an amazing resource. So where can you find the General Register of Chinese Immigration images? Uh, you can find them in these, well, images in three places. Um, LAC, it is indexed um, because we've already covered Library and Archives Canada search. I'm instead going to demonstrate family search. I've just mentioned the Excel spreadsheet and then Heritage Canadiana, which is not indexed. And this is a demonstration of navigating the General Register of Chinese Immigration Ledgers at Family Search. The link to this site is in the handout. 
There are several ways to search the site. I do recommend trying the nominal search index first and then getting more creative with your searches. Recently, I've been interested in Reverend Chen Sing Kai, and so I'm going to see what there is for him here. He was born in China about 1852. You will see I've provided the entire name in the search box. For more practiced researchers, you can research with other people. I like to start with a very general search to begin. Here is a page of results. There are 16. None of them look like my person. And I would double check my information against what I think might be the record. So remember, you can try other names. Another way to research is to use the how to use this collection tab. That will bring you to the family search wiki. And if you're not familiar with wikis, they are like a how-to guide on how to do genealogy for a plethora of countries around the world. In this case, we're looking for this particular record set, and it will tell you lots of information about what you can find. I don't have scope to be able to read this entire page to you, but I'd like to bring your attention to inventory. Here in the inventory, Family Search has detailed what is on each of the microfilms that has been digitized. This alone will save you tons and tons of time researching. And in my case, I would be looking for a date range that covered his known immigration year, which was 1888. From the inventory, then, we will select this one film, which comprises all of this information. And we get this record. This tells us about the microfilm information. Clicking on the link under image group number will take us to the digital images from that microfilm. Now, if you've never seen this sort of presentation, the main window are the digital images. The right-hand side is information about the records and the film, including family searches citation information. At the top is the image number, which will become very useful when you find your record, and tools. In this case, you can do a split screen or you can make it larger or smaller. For now, I'm going to get rid of the index information to make our screen bigger. And before you jump in, I will explain how digital images that have been imaged from microfilm are laid out. There are 590 images in this set. They look like this. When you are trying to familiarize yourself with the layout, what you're looking for are things like cover sheets. That's like this thing here. This one here. Here's another cover sheet on image number 252. And so that's the first thing I do when I look at a big set of images like this. If you have the ability, look for the markers in between the images to see where you are. And then the first thing that you do to hone in so you don't have to read all of the images is to figure out where you are. This is the Register of Chinese Immigration, Port of New Westminster. I know that Chan Sing Kai did not arrive at the Port of New Westminster, but rather the Port of Vancouver. So this set of images is not the set I'm looking for. 
we've got the general register of Chinese immigration and then a bunch of numbers. Unfortunately, I don't know which number he uh, was recorded in the ledger. And so this is where I would begin. But take an expert tip, see where it ends. Sometimes the record you want is closer towards the end than the beginning. So where is the beginning? What are we looking at? We're looking at records number one from September 1st, 1885 in Victoria. Chen Sing Kai arrived about November, 1888. So that's quite a number of years after this. I therefore want to see where the record set for this ledger ends on the film. What image number is that? It's here, number 252 which says, this is the Register of Chinese Immigration 1889. Now remember, Chen Sing Kai came in November 1888. Therefore, my record is probably closer to this end of the set of records than the previous one. So I'm gonna go backwards, not forwards. What date are we looking at? This is August 1889. We're still in June 1889. At this point, I would skip down to the film strip to jump ahead of the records. And here we are. This is Chen Sing Kai and his family on the general register. Very hard to read, but this is him here, Chen Sing Kai and his family. Once you've found the record, make sure to download it to your computer and capture the citation information of Great importance, as you can see, is which image number is on the film, image 212 or 590. So as you can see <laughs> from our demonstration of a four of the five databases, this is complicated stuff. And I really wanted to show you just a, a quick taste of what it's like to actually research each one of these records, the things that you need to know, the way it's laid out, the information. And um, it, it does take some time, but it is so incredibly rewarding. So if you are searching for the General Register of Chinese Immigration, let's go through this one more time. The very first place that I would check is Library and Archives Canada, Collection Search Advanced Immigrants from China. You want to find their indexed records. That is by far the fastest way to find it. And then you can use the blue line technique, download, copy, et cetera. If you can't find it in Library and Archives Canada for a plethora of different reasons, then this is where you go. Search Family Search because it is much easier to look at the entire data set than to keep bashing your head against nominal searches that don't work. That's very frustrating. Use any combination of names, create a list of names, write down the different spellings of names, cross them off as you're checking through. If the record shows up in the nominal search, great, <laughs> then you can skip the next steps. Uh, download, save the citation information, make sure that you record the image number. Okay, so if neither of those two techniques work as I demonstrated in this example, then you're gonna to have to search by microfilmed images. And it's a very different technique than just than searching by a, a database that brings you the record. Use what you know, go through the image sets, look for cover sheets, look for breaks in the information. Write that stuff down. Maybe even write down all the different ways that you used to search because if you're at it, been going at it for hours like I do, you forget all the different ways that you've searched. And don't forget, there is a spreadsheet. Use the University of British Columbia spreadsheet to help you narrow and find down. There are various ways to go at this and I encourage you to use them all. Okay, so that was searching uh, on the online databases. 
I promised that I would give a quick summary of what's going on with case files in Canada as of January 2024. So let me tell you a story. Uh, when uh, Marissa Louie Lee of California was Uh, methods at the Salt Lake Institute of Genealogy course, she contacted me and said, hey, Linda, here in America, we have, I'm paraphrasing, we have uh, case files, Chinese case files, they're available at the National Archives and Records Administration, or NARA, uh, does Canada have similar case files? And I said, no, I don't think so. How wrong can a person possibly be? <laughs> and when you're Anyway, so of course that got me curious and that I fell down such a deep, deep rabbit hole. Started researching Library and Archives Canada, looking for finding aids, learning about finding aids. And eventually I wrote a blog post um, called uh, Finding Aids for uh, Chinese Case Files at Library and Archives Canada. And I've just expanded on that work, looking into funny is this is like research of a next level. I'm not looking for the records. I'm looking for the record collections to find the records. And I'm looking for finding aids to find the record collections to find the collections. And, and it just goes, it, it's such a rabbit hole. So I had this method um, posted um, online and uh, Robert Louis uh, wrote to me to say, hey, Linda, I have a case file. So Robert was the first one to prove my method in uh, January, uh, that was a year ago, a year ago. Holy cow. Everyone, like, I, I don't know if you have ever had the pleasure of writing out a methodology and having someone else prove it for you, but it is amazing. And since then, um, so many people, I won't name them because I'll, I'll leave people out, and I have been having a long running conversation about case files. We have learned, for example, that a Chinese case file in Canada can only be accessed through the formal request process at Library and Archives Canada, the access to information and privacy protocol. In other words, if you rock up at uh, Library and Archives Canada in Ottawa and you say, hey, I would like a Chinese case file, I have all these documents and all this information, they will say, I'm sorry, you're going to have to go through the ATIP process. So uh, it's only through ATIP, only through a formal process request. Uh, it costs $5. You have to be a Canadian citizen to register for this process. Um, if you are successful, you get this incredible collated file. For my Americans and the audience, it's more like an A file than it is a, a National Archives Chinese case file. There is a fair level of redaction. We are still learning our way through the process. Um, we are finding that the paper trail collection, which again, only came online uh, June, July, 2023, has the clues to point towards case files. Now, did all those case files make it to the National Archives, we're not sure. Uh, there are nominal indices that are available. Uh, I've counted up about 17,000, but of the finding aids, two thirds are restricted. Two thirds of the finding aids to help us find the things are restricted. So this is these are, we are working around the gaps of the information that we currently know. How many are there? We're not really sure. But of the 30 case files that I have now seen, are they worth it? 100%. We're now working on um, a process which will hopefully help Library and Archives Canada reduce the level of redaction if we can anticipate what it is that they want to redact due to Canadian privacy laws. Uh, this is a hot topic in genealogy for Asian Canadians. And I think I'm just going to have to leave it there. Okay. What did we cover? <laughs> a lot, a lot, a lot. Holy cow. So we talked about genealogy. Uh, we talked about the common categories of genealogical records and the exceptions for Chinese genealogy. Please, if you're doing Chinese genealogy, know that this is like already intermediate to advanced level work. 
just to do this type of work. There are three foundational collections, the paper trails, CI-44s and CI certificates, the CI-9s and the general register. I gave you an update on Chinese case files as of January, 2024. We looked at the four sets of foundational records, the CI certificates, the 400 at UBC. We looked at the CI 44s, the 60,000 some records, the general register, the 18 ledgers. We looked at yeah, 130,000 CI nines, but do we actually have five sets of foundational records? Do we have many more Chinese case files than we know? We don't know. The scope is unknown. In genealogical terms, Chinese case files are really, really new. It's only been this year that we've seen them, or this last year, 2023. And so research continues into these and will do so for the foreseeable future. We might need help asking the government to open them. We'll see. Now, before I let you go, I would like to spend just a moment talking about the handout. I have written a 27 page guide that is meant to be standalone. I have thrown a lot of information at you in this webinar. Take it in, it is recorded. Feel free to pause it and see it and play it back again. The handout is for beginner to intermediate genealogists who want to go further with these records. For each category of record, I do a little bit of cross-referencing. Where else can you go? For every type of record, I have asked and answered the question, what is it? Who created it? What is on it? Where can I find it? And what else can I do with it? Because in genealogy, we are always looking for the entire picture, not just when our ancestor came into the country, not just when they left the country, but everything. Remember, this entire talk has been government records created under the umbrella of Chinese immigration. By no means is this all the records there are. There are tax records. There are voters records after 1949. There are city directories. There are census records. It is just the beginning, but what a beginning. It is truly the wedge or the, the intro. Understanding the Exclusion Act and the 60 plus years of the Chinese Immigration Act are the key to understanding Chinese Canadian genealogy. Thank you so much to the Chinese Canadian Museum for asking me to present to you today and to all of the people. It has been decades and I have asked so many people so many questions. They have shared so much of their knowledge and this is a list, it's not an exhaustive list, it's not even a complete list. I'm looking at it and I'm thinking of people that I've forgotten to mention for long running conversations for the paper trail people, for um, for June Chow, archivist, for current and on running uh, conversations about case files, about Library Archives Canada, and for Catherine, for all of her work with the, heading up the team, for her curatorial tours at the museum for knowledge on just everything. Uh, Mary, again, uh, for long running conversations currently, Lily for our conversation back in summer, so many people. And, and let me not skip out on the professors. Thank you, Imogen. Thank you, Lily. Thank you, uh, Timothy. And thank you, Henry, for answering my questions on stuff I don't understand. There's so much I don't understand even now. I'm an expert and there's still tons I don't understand. Kelly, who was my mentor for my uh, ICAP gen, uh, my accreditation paper, uh, which I'm working on to become accredited uh, in Western Canada at the international level. And my family, Yip Sang, my great grandfather, Chin Shou, my great grandmother, uh, Kyu Shak Yip, my grandfather, my dad, Cecil, his brother, Dick, Hoi, and Grace, our Yip family historians, Hoi, who passed away last year, and to my community. I literally would not be able to do this without you. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Linda, for this fabulous talk. Um, I think I can speak for everyone in saying that this was so informative and I learned so much just from this and I'll definitely be listening to uh, the recording again uh, to, to review some of that information. So now we'll move into the question and answer portion of this webinar. Um, we were able to answer quite a few of the questions that came in um, in the chat, but there are a few of them that I think would um, be well, it would be great to just have those answered by you live. So there's one um, that asked, who are the people who might have a case file and what kind of activities would lead to a case file being started? Fabulous question. Okay, so uh, this is not exhaustive, please. This is preliminary and dropped. Right now, uh, my original theory was that case files were created for uh, every time a Chinese person ran afoul of the law. And we're not sure if those records survived to today, if they were transferred from the Department of Immigration through to the National Archives, because the records that we are searching for are all at the National Archives. Therefore, the records we are finding at the National Archives are uh, reunification case files. So after exclusion was repealed and after Chinese persons were finally able to start applying for reunification of our families together, it's those applications when immigration officials and uh, many, many other bodies connected with one another to discuss the person's file. Were they a good citizen? Who were they? Um, they pulled various bits of information. They created family trees. And they had a, law, a discussion amongst themselves as to whether or not uh, this application would be approved. So we are seeing a lot of reunification style, 1950s, 1960s collections uh, of case files. We are also seeing pension applications. So when a Chinese person applied to the government for government monies, that appears to be a trigger for creating a case file that we can access today. Uh, I uh, noticed, for example, I did a blog post, a four-part blog post that took me 40 hours to research on George Singh of Saskatchewan, and it shows his attempts to reunify his family by bringing one son and then another son, and it also references a criminal case where he had been arrested and convicted because he was in the same building, same building as a crime was committed. He must have done it because he was there, right? And, and that, unfortunately, carried through um, coloring every decision immigration made on his file for the rest of it. So these case files are incredible. They are absolutely worth having, even if some of the case files I've seen are like 50 or 60% redacted. And that's what we're doing is we're trying to work on reducing that level of redaction. Great, thank you. Uh, there's another question related to the case files. Does the CI9 project still need volunteers? And what would be the best way to go about volunteering, if so? Yes, please. <laughs> More the merrier. You got 90,000 transcriptions. Uh, I don't know uh, where we are right now with the, the transcription project, but this lookup tool, this draft lookup tool, the CI9 transcription project is way more than just CI9s. Like I, I, Robert Louis is heading that team. I'm just in to advise and comment as the team talks to one another. This is a project by Genealogy for Asian Canadians on Facebook. Um, we welcome everyone who has some time to come in to get familiar with uh, the records to, to transcribe some of the records. You will learn so much about the records, about the mistakes immigration officials made, about um, the numbers and how they relate to each other. I think, I hope this talk has shown that the forms and records and certificates that we're talking about, they're not standalone documents. They're all related to each other. They all point to each other. And, uh, and uh, this tool, this lookup tool, also references other records. And so it's it's just, it's going to be such an, it is already such an incredible tool. 
and we just we want our community to have better access to information. Yeah, and I just posted Linda's uh, Facebook group, Genealogy for Asian Canadians, in the chat um, for anyone who is interested in checking it out. We have a few questions um, about databases and notation of names. So one, do the databases recognize that Chinese people notate their names with surname first, followed by first name? So about the question, the order of, of names. Okay, <laughs> now they do. <laughs> oh my goodness. I used to research Library and Archives Canada. I can't, I don't even want to tell you how long it took me to figure out that in the previous iteration of collection search, it didn't. <laughs> that, that if you search for Yip Wing C, it wasn't the same to them as Wing C Yip. And so I would spend time with every combination of C Wing Yip, Wing C Yip, Yip Wing C, Yip C Wing because it didn't and now it does now it's much more keyword search so in library archive canada's collection search for example you can use the all this words function which does not then um, work on the order of words now that is not um i i do want to touch on ancestry's collection so ancestry is the main index collection of ci44 records and when they mapped out the information from the forms to the records, it, they assumed it was surname first. And therefore, because it maps to a particular area on the form, it, you would be well advised when you're searching on Ancestry to pump through any of the, your three or two or however many names. So Yip Wing C, that's three different words in the surname field because in Ancestry, it is not mapped that way. Now, in Family Search, I would suggest it's exactly the same as Ancestry. Use all three keywords, and pump all of those into your surname, and uh, HC, yeah, not index, so it doesn't apply. Great, and another question um, that was about naming conventions. So she, S-H-E-E, -E, is seen on many women's names. Could you talk a little bit about what that means? <laughs> oh, can I? <laughs> First, I have to start with this story. <laughs> so Yip Sang, uh, the Yip Sang family, uh, we had the benefit of this enormous family tree. And my great grandfather had four uh, wives and each of them were uh, she, so Li Shi. Wang Shi, Dong Shi, and Qin Shi. And, and, and honestly, I, I honestly believed as a child reading, um, because you know, I don't read Chinese, um, that they all had the same surname. They just all came to the same plan. And, and it was an embarrassingly long period of time before I figured out, wait a second, that's not actually a surname. Okay, so Shi, it actually means wife or woman from the clan of... So my great grandmother, Qin Shi, uh, is a wife who came from the Qin clan. And so that, that character, she, which in English is spelled S-H-E-E, S-Z-E, S-H-I, and any permutation of Shi or she, first of all, you can recognize that that word as meaning this is a wife but that is not her married surname. This is not Mrs. Chin. This is your great-grandmother, my great-grandmother, who came from the Chin clan. And that's the meaning of the word she. So as soon as you recognize that in government records, and um, it, it it's both a positive and a, a, a negative, because first of all, it does give you her clan name, which in English, you know, if you said Mrs. Thomas Moore, you don't actually know anything about her other than that she was married to Thomas More. But if you say Qin Shi, you, don't, you know her family clan. You just, you don't know her given names. And it's very, very, very common in our families not to know your grandmother's actual name because Papa, Mama, you never ever would use it. Yeah, so many different naming conventions and things that make it 
unique that are unique to Chinese people and genealogy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for answering that. And so just to uh, hop over the the the, um, the embarrassment of of not knowing the answer to that question, please. That is so common. I'll ask the I'll ask anyone, you know, what was your great grandmother's actual name? And they'll say, I don't really know. And yeah, that is normal. Yeah, I don't actually know my great grandmother's name either. <laughs> Chinese. Um another question um more broadly about head tax certificates, CI certificates. Um, I'm assuming this is a question that is directed towards the paper trail archive that's on UBC um, rare books and special collections. Uh, if someone has a CI that's not there, where should they go to submit it? Hi, it's Catherine. Um, I think the easiest thing to do is to actually email us at this point because it depends on where people are located in the country or some of them are coming in from from other countries. And so the email is 1923.chinese.exclusion at gmail.com. And then we can discuss you know, scanning specs and things like that with, uh, with the person. And uh, just so uh, a couple of other things related to that, we are continuing to collect until the end of June uh, of this year. And then we'll have to cut off in order to uh, to actually finish, uh, there's a lot more cataloging they'll have to be due with all these new ones that are being submitted. And there's many coming in now from across the country. And also just one other thing I wanted to add on the paper trail collection at UBC. Um, if you, once you bring up a person's record, if you go down to the bottom of that screen, you'll see something called access point, I think. And the person's name, if you click that, you will get um, their biography, uh, whatever, uh, was sent in from the family about that person's life and where they were born and some memories of them. Some of them are very, very sweet stories that have come in. So just to remember that the biography is is also part of the uh, the revealing of someone's story. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, question on CI6 forms. What are those? So what we're finding is every certificate had a matching form and uh, CI-5s and CI-6s are related. CI-44s and CI-45s are related. Uh, it, the process appears to have been in the issuance of a certificate, the matching form is like one letter down. So a, um, a CI-5, when I... A CI-5 is one of the original entry and landing certificates, a so-called head tax certificate. A CI-5 was in um, response to the payment of a head tax. A CI-6 is the form relating to the CI-5, and it would have, we are assuming, the same level of information of intricate detail that we see on the CI-44s and the CI-9s. Now, within case files, we're keeping a look out for these, these records that we haven't seen before, because this is the, the archive that appears to have them. And I haven't yet, I think, actually, let me walk that back. I do have 30 files I'm looking at, and it's hundreds and thousands of pages of, no, sorry, hundreds of pages of information. And so a CI6 um, form relates to a CI5 certificate. We may or may not have a copy of that now. This is a work in progress, and I, that's the best answer I can I can provide for you. And there, oh, and there's no currently yet available archive. I'm I, as I said, you know, we're doing a lot of research at Archives of Canada, and we're looking at finding aids, and we're looking at where are the collections, and we're looking at what are they called, and then we're looking at are they um, privately under privacy, um, are they restricted under Access Thirty Two. Great, thanks. There's a question about the US version of records. I know this is probably a whole other can of worms, but if you could just speak very briefly to any major sources you recommend 
for searching for Chinese genealogy in the U.S. Um, for immigration around the 1800s? Actually, thank goodness for the U.S. It was the U.S. that uh, where I learned to understand the format, the process, and the procedures for case files in Canada. The United States brought in the Exclusion Act three years before Canada in 1882, and my sense on the work that we're doing is that Canada really adopted a lot of the processes for American case files. Now you asked, where are the resources? Uh, for Canadians, for Canadians, Chinese, there are potentially American case files for your family. Let me just say that one more time. If you crossed into the United States during the exclusion period, for any reason whatsoever, you went shopping to Michigan or, I don't know, Washington State, you went to Seattle, you went to, to Vegas for the weekend, there is potentially a Chinese Canadian, uh, an American case file for you to find. For Western Canada, the archive for American case files, flat out, Canadian or, or anyway, uh, and I, I forget how many um, miles of records they have, it, there's a lot, um, is at Seattle the Seattle NARA uh, office. Um, look for um, Chinese Exclusion Act case files. Uh, I think it's .com. There's a blog. There's a team of researchers that do this work. They are incredibly helpful. Number two, I would look for Chinese Family History Group. They're based out of California. They have tons of resource for, resources for finding American case files, which are actually way more accessible, not redacted. You just have to pay a buck a page once you find them. And then thirdly is the Chinese Historical Society of New England or Chesney. They are a huge resource for American case files for the Eastern Seaboard. That includes uh, Boston, major port like New York, and down the Eastern Seaboard. So I hope I've covered that question. I tossed in a couple of links into the chat there um, for anyone interested in checking that out further. Uh, we're coming up on the end of our time. So we'll just do maybe one or two questions. Um, this one might be. Uh, Interesting, actually. So there is someone who said, I understood back in, mid eight, in the mid 1880s, many Chinese immigrants were registered with a triad in Victoria who looked after um, their shipping their body home after they died. Are there records of this anywhere that you know of? Yeah, that's a great question. So we're thinking about a Harling Point which is the southern tip of Vancouver Island in British Columbia. That would be the bone repository. Uh, I'm not the expert on Harling Point or the Chinese cemetery. Um, I don't offhand know of any surviving records for um, bone repatriation, which is the name. Um, but you know what, I would ask um, I would ask uh, Charlene Thornton Joe at the Chinese Museum, Chinese Canadian Museum in Victoria. She um, has, this is one of her lifelong passions. She knows way more about this subject than I do. Great, thanks. Oh. And <laughs> also, apparently, John Adams is here, so we can ask him as well. <laughs> yeah, John. You have not to put you on the spot, but if you have anything that you'd like to add, uh, we could, you know, <laughs> hand you the mic, so to speak. Um, another quick question, hopefully, is there anyone who specializes in Chinese geo genealogy at Library Archives Canada that we can get in touch with? I think I know the answer to this, but. So there is a person at Library and Archives Canada who has the entire immigration portfolio, not just for Chinese, but for every nationality. Her name is Emily Letourneau. Uh, she is a good resource uh, for immigration records. Uh, it is my dream that we will have a dedicated Chinese Canadian archivist at Library and Archives Canada. 
uh, there's so much research that could be done that would benefit our community, not just not just in Ottawa, not just BC, not just Canada, but but everywhere. Thanks. A uh, question about paper sons. If someone immigrated to Canada as a paper son, but later changed their name back to their actual name, are there any records to trace back to one's original immigration record? I guess this is kind of a two-part question because you may want to explain what a paper son so, is for those who are okay, so, not familiar. Uh, let me just preface that by explaining a little bit about privacy laws in Canada. When we are looking at more recent records and uh, the situation you're discussing is really about the Canadian, oh, what's the name of it? Um, amnesty, that's not the right word, uh, but the, basically the Canadian Amnesty Program. I think that was the 1960s, 1970s. That is really recent for genealogy. Um, you would be applying to the government department for those records and um, you would need to made, make a pretty strong case for that and um, potentially be a blood relative. Uh, and I, so yes, it's doable. That that's that's how I would begin looking for that. But it uh, <laughs> it's next level difficult. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think um, we'll cut off the questions there. Um, but I do want to thank you once again, Linda, so much for sharing your time and your expertise with us. Uh, and there's just so much detail again in, in these talks. So I uh, invite everyone to listen to the recording um, that will be made available on the Chinese Canadian Museum website under the program page for this webinar. So if you um, search um, discovering your families or finding your families paper trail and navigating government paper trails under our programs pages, um, you should be able to find this. Uh, I also want to encourage everyone to join us for the next two talks in these series. So the next one will be given by Catherine Clement, who is here with us today, um, on other paper trails to explore. So finding other areas in which um, you can find more information about your family genealogy that will take place on February 18th, uh, again at 10 a.m. Uh, Pacific Standard Time. Uh, or yeah, and then our last talk in the series is preserving your family's paper trail with Chinese Canadian archivist Jun Chow, who was primarily responsible for digitizing and well archiving, not just digitization, but um, for handling the entire archive for the paper trail collection. Um, and her talk will um, focus on you know, what to do with some of these documents and how to carry on your family's legacy. So that will take place on March 17th at 10 a.m. PST. You will need to register for these talks as well. So I put those, chat, um, those links in the chat and we'll be sending those in a follow-up email to all attendees along with the recording and the handout that was distributed here. We also, if, if anyone has any specific questions that they want to ask about any CI certificates, we also have office hours um, for our research room that is located in our uh, physical Vancouver location, 51 East Pender Street. So Naomi, who is here today with us, uh, holds these office hours on Thursdays and Saturdays from 1 to 5 p.m. And she's been such a great great person to have. They're a great resource with, uh, you know, a wealth of knowledge as well in helping people to, you know, navigate all of these different records and archives that, some of which that Linda talked about today. Um, I don't think I'm missing anything else there, uh, but yeah, feel free to email us and we can also forward, you can find Naomi's uh, email on the website on our paper trail exhibition uh, page. So yeah, thank you once again, everyone for attending this talk and thank you again, Linda, for making time for us. And we hope to see you at our future talks. Take care, everyone.